And if you haven't been here over the last couple of weeks, we have been in a brand new series titled Reset. And the vision behind this series is to teach you how to rest, how to trust God in in every situation that you're facing today. And I got to be honest with you, um, I was preparing my message last night, and it was one of those messages that I felt like God just kept changing. It just kept changing and kept changing. And, And God wants to show you a deeper revelation of getting closer to Him, but He ultimately wants you to see that the rest that He has for you is a gift. It is a gift for your life. It is something to bless your life and to actually help you move by faith so that you're not worried over every battle that you're facing, every trial that you're going through. Or when people start to criticize you, you're not running away. Why? Because you trust the Lord. And so you're able to sleep at night. And again, remember what David said. He said, I'm able to sleep like a baby because the Lord has surrounded me. He's protecting me. I know what God has for me. But do you? Ask yourself that question today. Do you know what the Lord has for you? Right now, even in your seasons of of trials and the things happening in your life, are you still holding on to the promises that God has spoken over your life? Where are you going in this life? Because when I think about having rest, the most difficult place to have rest is in the, the mind. Like your life can actually be pretty good. You can have everything going on good in in, in a good way for you, but your mind can still feel restless. You still feel like there's meetings to go to and things to take care of and problems to solve. And for some of you right now, your mind will not be quiet. Is that you? Go ahead and raise your hand today. Like your mind will not stop talking. It will not shut up. It just keeps going all through the night. Well, this is the worst case scenario in every situation. And you just want to be like, brain, turn off. Like, have you ever said that out loud, looking like a crazy person? Like, somebody's like, who are you talking to? Just myself, it's fine. Uh, Like, brain, just just shut off for a little bit. I just don't want to hear it anymore. I don't want to have those thoughts that are consumed by worry and fear. And so if that's you today, I want to show you these scriptures and show you a contrast here between James chapter 1 and Isaiah chapter 26. Let's start with James chapter 1. Verse 8, okay? Now, James is stating that those that are going through trials, he said that they are double-minded. Write this down. They are double-minded. And so since they are double-minded, guess what? They are unstable. Look at the wording there. That's very powerful. Because their mind, they have a double mind right now. And the way that they're living, they are unstable in all other ways, meaning they don't know who to trust. They don't know if they should trust God over this situation or trust people. Trust God or trust your feelings. And sometimes your feelings are trying to rip you away from God. No, 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 no. This is the relationship I have for you. This is the job you should take. This is what makes you feel good. Listen, let me make this very clear. Your feelings can give you the wrong direction. Your feelings can lead you astray because what seems great one day can feel miserable the next day. Feelings come and go. I say this all the time. Like, I feel great when I eat a cheeseburger. But if I eat too many, long after that, I don't feel that great anymore. Emotions come and go, but the word of the Lord always stays. God will never lead you astray. And I want you to know that today. If you get to know his voice, he's always going to lead you into the right direction. But just like we just spoke about with the Israelites, sometimes that is the longer route. Because you're not ready for the battles ahead. You're not ready for the battles you're about to face. And so he's maturing your faith right now. But don't allow your mind to be conflicted with God's way and the world's way. Follow the Lord instead. But I also see another dilemma when it comes to our mind. I believe that every one of us have experienced the peace of God at some point in our life. At some point in your life, you came into this church or maybe another church and you felt God, you felt his presence, you felt him speak to you, and maybe you came down to this altar and you laid it all down. Ron, will you hand me that uh, trash can over there? I saw this illustration this past week. I was like, oh, this is good. Because for a lot of us, you know, we had this trash can in our life. We're like, God, I got a lot of trash. I came into church looking like this today. I got some things to give away. And God meets you and he speaks to you. And you're like, thank you, Lord. And then Jesus said, hey, come to me and I'll give you rest. Lay your burdens down, right? So what do we do? A lot of us come down to the altar. and We're like, all right, God, thank you so much. And we leave it here. And you feel that peace and you feel that rest. And it's amazing. 
But then what happens in life? You leave church, trials come, people start to criticize you, people start to say things toward you, and then the rest that God gave you as a gift, you give it back and you take back the trash. This is our mental state. This is what we do over and over again. God, you gave me peace, but then people started talking bad about me. And so I took it back. God's like, why would you take it back? Why would you take back this mental state right now? Because people are attacking you. Newsflash, when you're doing the right thing, the devil is going to attack you. The devil wants you to pick your trash back up and allow it to consume your mind. This is what it means to be double-minded. You don't know what to do. Thank you, Ryan. You don't know what to do in life. And so God is offering this peace. And so let's dive a little deeper. Because the question I want to ask you today is, are you allowing God's peace to fade away? Remember, the Bible is very clear. The devil can't take that away from you. But he can convince you to give it away. He can convince you just to leave it all behind and stay worried and full of anxiety and stress. So let's dive deeper. All right, James chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. James also said, for you know that when your faith is tested, don't just run away because your endurance now has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, perfect and complete, you will lack nothing. You need nothing. Why? Because you have the presence of God. You get to stay in perfect peace. Peace can't be taken away from you. So no matter what your trials look like, I trust God. Verses six through eight. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Some of you today, you need to underline that right there. Put your faith in God. Stop putting all your faith in people. People are going to let you down. Even with the right intentions, trying to help you, people are going to let you down. Stop putting all your faith in your spouse. Your spouse loves you, but your spouse is going to let you down too. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to do wrong things at certain times. They're going to leave, you know, beard shavings all over the sink, and it's going to drive you crazy. Leave the toilet seat up or down, okay? It's going to drive you crazy at times. But don't put all your faith in your spouse. Put all your faith in God alone. He wants to make sure that you understand this because only God will never fail. God doesn't make mistakes. Because when you put your faith in people or even into your feelings, you start to waver. So do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is unsettled. Is that your mental state right now? Restless, unsettled, getting beat up by the waves around you. A good day and a bad day the next, and it's hard to know where you're going in life. It's unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. That's a powerful statement. Such people who live this way, who have this mental state, should not receive anything from the Lord. Why? Because their loyalty is divided. You cannot worship the world and worship God. You cannot serve two masters. You will hate one and you will love the other. When it comes to your trust and who you're serving, guess what? You're serving someone. Whether you know it or not, you're serving the world. You could even serve the devil's purposes and not even know it. But I'm praying today that you choose to serve the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world. This is what it means to have a double mind. And they are unstable in everything that they do. That's a powerful verse. When you do not trust God, your mind is uneasy and restless. What has attacked your mind this week? What things have kept you up all night? What do we normally do when these things happen in our life? We complain, we grumble, and sometimes we gossip. But instead of doing those things, which is our sinful nature... What we should do is bring it to the Lord. That's what James is saying. He's saying, you know what? When you're going through the trials and conflict, instead of speaking it out to everybody else who doesn't even know your situation, 
And it's probably not going to give you the right answers on what to do. You can bring it before God and God will still give you peace and rest and establish your faith in a better way because he leads with direction. So your mind is able to rest. Now listen to this. Isaiah chapter 26, verse three. Those with sound thoughts. Okay, again, notice the contrast here. Those with sound thoughts, you will keep in peace and peace because they trust in you. God is promising two things in your life. First of all, that you can have peace. The second thing, this is really good. You can remain in the peace. So again, don't give the gift back just because life got hard, because God is maturing your faith and showing you what he can do in your life. And so the title of today's message is rest for the mind, rest for the mind. Um, And the title kind of made me laugh because since last night, God has been showing me new things, new things, new things. So I haven't had much rest yet, but I believe there's going to be a lot of deliverance today, even for myself upon our mental states. Okay. And what I want to do today is show you revelations of the different mindsets and how to overcome these things. Um, But you need to understand today as a believer, as a believer in Christ, the devil is waging war against your mind against the way you think, what you believe, the direction of life, where you're going, right? And so the first thing that I wanna share with you is this, okay? This is how you overcome. Point number one, you need to learn today how to recognize stubborn strongholds, notice the wording here, that has been planted in your mind. Stubborn strongholds, you need to learn how to recognize these things that have been planted in your mind, meaning they came from another source. They came from somebody else's mouth. They came from the news. They came from social media. They came from the enemy. The enemy has planted thoughts of fear and worry and anxiety and stress in your mind. What are you doing with the thought? Because that's when it becomes very dangerous. Uh, One pastor stated it like this. He said, demons, you can cast out quickly, but strongholds, you have to break down a little at a time. Why though? Like we're talking about a slower process here because it takes time to retrain your mind. It takes time to retrain your mind. Did you know that you can do that though? The Bible is very clear about your thought patterns that you can retrain your thoughts to believe in God, to focus on God. So when you have a doubtful thought, guess what you can do? You can go into the word of God and look up doubt. And look at what God says about doubt so that you don't have to believe your doubt. Because the truth is, even as a believer who's on fire for God, you're going to face doubt. But you don't have to believe doubt. That's the difference. The world is believing in their doubt. You do not have to believe in doubt. But before I show you scriptures, let me make this also clear. As a believer in Jesus Christ, okay, filled by the Holy Spirit, demons cannot possess you. Okay. Demons cannot control you. Uh, I want you to think of the Holy Spirit like a bouncer. (laughs) Okay. Demons tried to attack you. The Holy Spirit's like, no, you can't get in. Like you're not allowed in here. Okay. So the Holy Spirit is protecting you. Demons know this. Satan knows this. So what he wants to do is mess with your mind, get you to believe the wrong things. Okay. Because Satan knows, listen to this, the direction of your life is led by your most dominant thoughts. Your dominant thoughts will direct your life. So you need to know today, are these thoughts coming from God or somewhere else? Do they go against scripture or are these thoughts in line with what scripture is stating? Proverbs chapter 23 verse 7 states it like this. For as he thinks within himself, so is he. As he thinks about himself, as he thinks in his heart, that is who he is is. Okay. And again, that's Proverbs 23, verse seven. That's the passage translation. Um, So this raises the question too, how can Satan influence your thoughts? Well, we see this war that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter six, verse 14 through 16. And Paul stated, stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth. I love how Paul stated that though. He's saying, listen, you can fight. You don't have to run away from the enemy. I know that he looks big and bad. I know sometimes the giant is in your face. But again, when God shows up, God knocks down the enemy. You just have to move by faith. So stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth. 
and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes put on peace that comes from the good news. You can run with it. There's good news for your life. That's peace over your life and over your situation. And in addition to all these, he said, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. And if you grew up in Bible school, Or VBS growing up, we just had VBS last week, you know, as a child, many of us growing up in church heard about the shield of faith, right? Hold up the shield of faith so these fiery darts can't hit me. But I found out something interesting and you've seen it from movies. And when you learn ancient warfare, whenever they would send fiery darts off at an enemy, they would do it in large numbers. Have you seen that in movies where it's like coming up from all directions? Why? Because the enemy wants to hit you from every direction. That's the enemy's goal for your life. And so when he's shooting fiery darts, here's what I've realized in my life. I may have the shield of faith and I'm blocking all these things like Captain America, you know what I mean? Like just just blocking all these fiery darts, but still the enemy is trying to attack from every direction. So even though I block the darts, guess what? It can still create panic in my mind. Have you ever been through a situation, saw victory, but that fear is now still there because you went through it? And now you don't know how to get out of it. And so that's the devil's strategy for you. He's sending all these fiery darts from every angle. And even though you're blocking the darts, he still wants to place thoughts of fear and lies in your mind. And I heard this quote. It's really powerful. It says, because when you say yes to fear, you say no to a meaningful God-fulfilled life. When you say yes to your fear, you say no to a meaningful, God-fulfilled life. Why? Because you will never move. You'll always stay stuck. You'll always feel like you're at a dead end. What if Moses didn't raise the staff at the Red Sea? What if they got to the dead end and said, you know what? The enemy is coming up against me. The water's right there. God, I just don't have it in me to raise the staff. I don't have it in me to believe. You're scared stiff and you're paralyzed. And unfortunately, that's where a lot of us are today. So I'm going to show you a few examples out of the Bible on how Satan attacks your mind and how to recognize when the devil is attacking your mind. Okay. The first thing that I want to show you is this. Satan plants thoughts of temptation. This is what he does. He is the tempter. And I couldn't help but notice 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5. Um, and Paul stated, this is why I sent Timothy to you. He says, so that I could know about your faith. I sent him when I could not wait anymore. Listen to this. For I was afraid that the devil who tempts people may have defeated you with temptations so that our hard work would have been wasted. What is he saying? I've been praying for you. The church is growing. People are believing, but guess what? Persecution is growing too. And now they want to kill you. Now they want to harm you. And so that's when the devil shows up and he says, but you can go the easy route. You can take the shortcut. You can leave the plans of God and you can be safe. And he said, no, no, no. that is temptation. That is of the evil one. He's trying to deceive you. Every time you hear the voice that says, hey, you could be comfortable instead of walking into God's promises, that's the devil. Every time. For God did not call us into comfort but he told us to move by faith to see the impossible take place, right? And so we recognize that the enemy sometimes is placing temptation in our life and it can be different things. Sometimes it's pride, sometimes it's lust, sometimes it's just the desire to be better and and want people to recognize you and see these things in your life and you're struggling. How do you overcome these things? You guard your eyes because what you watch goes on the inside, goes into your heart. You guard your mouth, you guard your ears, you guard your heart. Stop allowing everything in. I I hear so many people saying, Pastor, I don't know why I'm so frustrated in my faith. What, What are you allowing into your heart? In your own house, what are you allowing into your heart? Guard your eyes, guard your heart, guard the way you think. And I promise you, as you get into the word of God, the way you think starts to change. Your words will start to change. The second thing is this, though. Satan also plants thoughts of doubt. This is what he does throughout the entire Bible. And we see this even in the beginning of everything. Out of the book of Genesis, 
God told Adam and Eve, and he said, listen, I have this beautiful garden for you. I have provided everything that you need. Just one lesson. Don't touch the fruit and that tree in the center of the garden. When I used to read that story, I was like, why did God put it in the center? Like, don't touch. That's like putting candy in front of a kid and say, don't touch that. Okay. Like, why would he put it in the center? And I realized this, because true love has to be a choice. Following God has to be a choice. And so the temptation was there, but they had to make the decision in their mind, will I trust what God has spoken over my life or will I take something of my own? And so what did the serpent do? Satan showed up and he planted doubt in their mind. Now listen to how he twisted the words of God. Genesis 3, verses 4 through 6. He said, you won't die. The serpent replied to the woman, what is he saying? He's saying, God is lying to you. Oh, God said, you're going to die. <laughs> you're not going to die. It's not going to happen that way, but your eyes are going to be open and you're going to see things like God. You can be God when you make your own decisions. As soon as you eat it, you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The most dangerous verse out of this is verse six. The woman was convinced. We're about to talk about that. But the woman was convinced. Adam was convinced as well. For Adam was with Eve, but he said nothing. He just went along with everything that was going on. They were convinced. They allowed the doubt of the enemy to come into their mind to believe that God was holding back something from them. Is that what you've done? Again, let's talk about relationships for a second. Have you jumped into relationships even though God has said this is not for you because you think God's going to hold you back from something you really want? And then the only thing you receive out of this is usually a broken heart or a devastated life that gets more and more complicated because your feelings got too deep, too quick, too soon. And you weren't listening to the Lord. This happens so many times. We have this doubt because we want things. And so we want it to be right, but God knows a better direction for your life. But watch out. For the enemy is like a roaring lion, ready to devour you, ready to attack. He wants to place doubt in your mind. I'll never forget, I watched this video. And this man used to be a Satanist who came to Jesus. And he said that he was into Wicca and witchcraft and all these things. And he said his main goal was to walk up to Christians or believers and put doubt in their head. That was his main strategy, to put doubt in their head. Are you sure God said this? Are you sure God wants to do that in your life? Are you sure that God is for you? When you start to entertain those thoughts, guess what? That's when you're led astray. So understand, it came from the enemy, okay? The next thing that I want to show you is this. The third thing, Satan plants thoughts to lie. You ever heard it like this? A little lie won't hurt anybody. It's just a little lie, but then you lie here, you lie there, you get comfortable with your lies, and then you're lying so much you don't even know what the truth is anymore, you know somebody like that? Like you talk about something that happened a long time ago and they can't even remember what the truth is anymore because they've lied so much about it. Did you know that there are seven things that are detestable to the Lord out of the Bible? God hates a lying tongue. Why? Because lies create division. They deceive. They lead people away from the glory of God. Guess who created lies? Satan. The Bible also states that he is the father of all lies, leading people astray. And so I want you to hear this story very quickly. In Acts chapter 5, verse 3, Peter is dealing with a man and his wife. The man's name is Ananias. And the people are giving to the church all that they have, and they're helping each other. And they're doing this with a joyful heart. But Ananias and his wife decide to hold back some of the money on their own but they wanted to lie about it in public. Why? Because they wanted to receive praise from people. It is such a silly lie. It is a dumb lie, but they wanted to receive praise from people. And I've realized even in our lives, sometimes we make or we create silly lies just to get praise. Approval from people. Why are you so desiring approval from people instead of approval from God? But Acts chapter 5 verse 3 states it like this. And Peter said to Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? Why did you let Satan fill your heart? For you lied to the Holy Spirit 
and you kept some of the money for yourself. Again, he wanted public praise. But how did Peter know this? The Holy Spirit. Here's the good news. The Holy Spirit shows up and he speaks to you when somebody is lying to you. The Holy Spirit will reveal to you when somebody's trying to deceive you, to come after you, to attack you. You can be aware because God always reveals the truth. Nothing can be hidden. Okay? But God revealed this to Peter. Now listen to verse 4 and 5, how serious a lie is in the presence of God. He said, how could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but you were lying to God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. And then his wife did the exact same thing. Do you see now that the war on our mind is serious? Do you see now that the devil wants to plant these thoughts of what? Death. That's what he wants to plant in your mind. He wants to plant thoughts of death. You're never going to go anywhere. You're never going to become anybody. You're never going to get free from this. Life is never going to get, never going to change for you. It's never going to get better. And that's hopelessness. That's restlessness. That's why you feel well, then I don't even deserve to be here. And again, that's a lie from the devil. There's a reason you're still alive today. God loves you and he wants to use you right now. And you can receive all of his promises. You can receive rest. Stop listening to the lies of the enemy. And then out of the Bible, there are many examples of this, but the most dangerous thought we see out of the Bible from Satan is on Judas to betray Jesus. Okay? Satan plants thoughts to betray Jesus. Let me say it like this as well. Satan will plant a thought in your head to walk away from Jesus, to do your own thing. This is interesting to me. John chapter 13, verse 2, it was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Okay, so it's supper time. Uh, Satan now plants this thought to betray Jesus. Not long after, in verse, uh, or Luke chapter 22, verse 3, Satan possesses Judas. I mean, just, just look at the order here. So Satan plants this thought in Judas's mind to betray Jesus at supper. And then not long after, Luke 22, verse 3, then Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12 disciples. He was possessed. Now, why was he possessed? Because he denied Jesus. Something very interesting about the way the disciples spoke to Jesus. Every disciple called Jesus their Lord and their Savior, but Judas never did. He only called him rabbi. Look it up. Every time he called Jesus, he said rabbi. Even when he betrayed him, he called him rabbi. He always called him good teacher, but he never made him Lord and Savior over his life. So he was empty completely empty for the devil to use in this moment. Satan planted a thought. He went with the thought and then he betrayed Jesus. Here's what I'm trying to make clear. Here's Satan's goal over your mind. He wants to plant a thought you will believe. It's that simple. And it can be that small sometimes. A little lie never hurts. A little look here is not a problem. Go ahead and do that. Nobody will know. You can do this for yourself. You can talk bad about this person. It's it's just little, little things. And what do you want? What he wants you to do? He wants you to believe it. He wants you to grow it. He wants you to, to cultivate it, to make sure that it can grow inside of your mind. Because if you help it grow, guess what it becomes? A demonic stronghold. That is what a stronghold is. A harmful restless thought that you can't get rid of. And now this thought becomes your identity, your self-worth, and what you're chasing after. This is why he said, this is a double mind. You don't know what you believe. You're living for the world. You're barely living for God. You're back and you're forth. You don't know who to trust. And you feel like you're lost. You're stuck. If that's you right now, recognize what stronghold is in your mind. Okay? What stronghold has been planted in your mind? Where did it come from? 
Who put it there? What experience happened in your life? And how can you move forward to see freedom? Because you can take that thought, Paul says, and make it observe the word of God, demolish the the silly arguments of the world, and see the truth of God's word in your life to experience freedom. That freedom is for you today. And I'm preaching this so that you can experience that freedom. But the first step is to recognize if a stronghold is in your mind at all. Okay? And this leads to point number two on how to move forward. To overcome an anxious mind, you have to move on from the past. Anxiety and stress and fear are usually the result of a past experience. Something that happened to you, something that you went through that you wish you didn't. And maybe it could go all the way back as you being a child in high school or, or, or even, even earlier on when people are making fun of you and calling you names. And those things can really stick around sometimes. Right? What they called you way back then has now become your identity. And you want to try so hard to prove to them that's not you anymore. You want to show them that that's not who you have become. You want to show them that you are successful. And so you're chasing all the wrong things for that thought. Why is it still in your head? Why is it still attacking your identity? Why does it still make you anxious? What does the Bible say about an anxious mind? Luke chapter 12, verse 29 and 30. Jesus said, do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have, here it is, an anxious mind. For these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. Can you relate to this passage today? Look at our economy. Um, Gas prices have skyrocketed. Grocery bills have tripled. If you have a large family, it's very easy to spend a ton of money now just to get barely anything. And so it can get in your mind like, oh my goodness, God, how are we going to make it? How is everything going to be okay? I think my wife went to the store last week and bought like two boxes of cereal and some milk, and it was like close to 40 bucks. Two boxes of cereal and some milk. And so it can be very easy to say, all right, God, my my job is not really working out. I'm not getting paid enough. I don't know if I'm going to make it. God, how am I going to be able to provide? And God is saying, I am the provider. And what I love about this text here, and again, I've revealed revealed it before, but but Jesus does a little switch up here. He, He starts speaking to the people about God, and then he changes and says, your father. Because he doesn't want the people to feel distant in their connection with the Lord. He doesn't want people to see that God is just some God in the sky that doesn't know them, doesn't know about the situation. He goes, no, no, no. God created all things. All good things come from above. Everything good placed in your life came from above. So he is your heavenly father. You know what your father will do? He will protect you. He will guide you. He will provide for you. So Jesus is stating to the people, I know right now, listen, the economy can be bad. You don't know what to eat. You don't know what to drink. But do not give in to the anxious mindset because it will drive you crazy. You start to attack people. You start to attack the people you love. Why? Because you're so stressed out. You can't even enjoy what God has given you. Many of us know that life. Jesus said in verse 30, your father knows. He knows the things that you need. You know what's cool about that? You don't even know the things that you need. (laughs) The things that you want aren't really the things that you need. But your father knows. And he provides it at the right time. But when you're worried, when you're anxious, where are you going? Who are you talking to? Are you going to social media? Because let me tell you right now, that's not going to help your mind. That's not going to bring calmness over your mind. Instead, run to the word of the Lord. Run to his presence. Because Jesus is also making the point very clear. You should look different. The rest of the world is is panicking because they don't know the Father like you know the Father. But you have a close relationship with him. He already knows the future, and he will direct your steps and show you everything that you need. Okay, so... 
Again, Jesus brought up this. Don't have an anxious, mind, anxious mindset over what you drink and what you eat. And I saw this really cool connection here between what Jesus said and how God provided for the Israelites in the wilderness. What did God promise the Israelites? He said, I have a promised land for you flowing with milk and honey. And I love what he spoke to Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 6 about the land. God stated, I took a solemn oath that day, okay, that I would bring them out of Egypt to a land. Now, look at the wording here that I had discovered and I had explored for them. If you have a good father that cares about your future, let's say you're, you're traveling somewhere, you're about to move somewhere, you're about to move to college, guess what a good father will do? He will check out that place for you. He will even go to the location to make sure that it's safe, that you have a good area. He will check out everything for you to make sure that you, his child, are protected. Listen to what the Lord does for you. He not only said, I have a promise for you of this land, he checked out the land. He was looking over the land, exploring it all. He saw the enemy there. He said, that's no problem. I'll get them out of the way. You're going to fight battles. You're going to see victories. I'm going to show up. That's no problem. But the land, the blessing is good for you. So he discovered and explored it for them. It's good land. A land flowing with milk and honey. The best of all the lands anywhere. Notice the wording there. It's always really good. And so they were free out of Egypt. They were on their way to the promise. And immediately, we talked about this before. I'm going to show you new revelations today. The anxious mind started to consume them. They became anxious. They wanted to get there quicker. Why did their mind become anxious? Food and water. What did Jesus say? Don't have an anxious mind over what to eat and what to drink. The Israelites were starting to not believe in the promise of God anymore because they, came, they became concerned over what to eat and what to drink. And so first it was water. They complained over these things. And here's what we see in Exodus chapter 15, verse 24 and 25. The people complained and turned against Moses. They said, what are we going to drink? They demanded the people were demanding. They had expectations from Moses. And Moses was called by God, but Moses didn't always have the answer. Sometimes the vision is big and people ask you, but how are we going to get there? I don't know. But how are these things going to work out for us? I don't know. How are we going to drink? How are we going to eat? I don't know. God, what do you want us to do? That's the best thing you could do as a leader. I don't know. Let me ask God. I didn't show up to save you. God is. So let me ask the one that's really leading us, because I don't know if you've noticed, I'm just carrying a staff, but the pillar uh, of a cloud during the day, that's what's leading us. The fire at night, that's what's leading us. I'm not leading us. I can't do that. So I'm listening to the Lord. And so Moses cried out to the Lord for help, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. This is so cool. God is amazing. And Moses throws it into the water, and this piece of wood made the water good to drink. So God just provided for them miraculously. Now they can drink water. They should be good. But like little children, what did they say? I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I, I, I need some food now. <laughs> they started grumbling over food. And, and what gets me is that they just saw this miracle from God. Moses asked God. God provided. But listen to what they're saying now because of an anxious mind. You say dumb things when you have an anxious mind. <laughs> it's so true. We all do, okay? Exodus 16, two through four. There too, the whole community of Israel complained. Nobody was asking or requiring of the Lord. They were just complaining about Moses and Aaron. They were complaining about their leaders. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. We would rather death in Egypt, which we were in bondage, by the way, all because we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. We were around meat and we had some bread. I would love a pizza right now, Moses. Right? I would love some steak right now. If I had that, I would be willing to die in Egypt. You remember, you remember Esau? Jacob and Esau? 
Esau had the birthright from the Lord, it was because of hunger he gave that gift away. Anxious mind, I need it now. God's not providing it now. I want this right now over my life. And it's not happening the way that I want it to. So I will give up my blessing to get the things that satisfy my flesh. That's the anxious mind. They would rather go back to bondage because they got some meat and bread instead of entering into the promise, a land flowing with milk and honey. Is that where you are right now? You're so sick of your situation because you're not in the promise yet. You're ready to go back to bondage. You're ready to go back to that relationship that wasn't good for you. You're ready to go back to that job that you know God said, that's not for you. You're ready to go back to that situation, back to that house, back to that state of being comfortable when God said to move. Why? You would rather be in bondage because at least you had some comfort in your bondage. You can become very comfortable with your demons, by the way, as well. They can haunt you. But for many of us today, we're more used to the demons attacking than actually seeing victory in our life over the demons. And it's sad. But I love how real Moses is. And we talked about Elijah last week. Listen to what Moses said. He had enough too. Numbers chapter 11, verses 12 through 15. (laughs) He said, did I give birth to them? I don't remember, God. Did I bring them into the world? Why did you tell me? to carry them in my arms like a mother carries a nursing baby. How can I carry them to the land that you swore to give their ancestors? Notice the wording there. How can I carry them into the promise that you swore to them? I don't know how to make this happen. Where am I supposed to get meat for all these people? They keep whining to me saying, give us meat to eat. I can't carry all these people by myself. The load is too heavy. Some of you, God is called as a leader, but you don't know how to delegate. You don't know how to create other leaders. You want to control every situation because you're saying, well, I'm the best at this, so let me do this. Let me do that. Let me take care of this. And now everybody that has a problem has to go to you, and you feel overwhelmed. And you have an anxious mind. This is Moses right now. He's saying, listen, you put in my hands the whole nation of Israel. You made promises over them. And now they're looking to me for the answers, God. I don't know what to do. I can't carry these people by myself. The load is too heavy. Then he said, if this is how you intend to treat me, just go ahead and kill me and do me a favor and spare me of this misery. Again, what did Jesus say? He said, ask the Father, and your Father will provide what you need. What I love about God, he's not threatened by the way you feel. You can be honest with God. Stop faking it. Stop saying, God, life is really good right now. I'm going through some trials. You know, uh, People are hurting me. They're, talk- they're really hurting me. God, uh, you know, like, be honest. And God, these people are making me angry. Can I pray that you shatter their teeth? Like, what what can I pray over right now, God? I'm struggling with some things. I don't know what to do. God would rather you be real and give you the answer you need than you pretending everything is okay. And so the Lord spoke to Moses and he told him what to do. Numbers 11, 16 and 17. Then the Lord said to Moses, gather before me 70 men who are recognized as elders and leaders of Israel. Verse 17, for I will take some of the spirit that is upon you and I will put the spirit upon them also. They will bear the burden of the people along with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. This is the difference of the old covenant versus the new covenant. In the old covenant, the Holy Spirit could only be placed upon a prophet or man of God, okay? But in the new covenant, because of Jesus Christ, now the Holy Spirit lives in all of us. We can all hear the voice of God and get his direction. So God placed his spirit upon these 70 men to help Moses. This is why it's important, especially as a church, to have a ministry staff, to have other pastors available and able to help. This is why it's important even in a church to create disciples, 
Because guess what? You're a follower of Jesus too. God has called you to disciple people, to teach people, to pray over people, to move by faith and to help the needy, to do these things for the glory of God. We need a team. We're all the body of Christ. We all have different talents. And here's what I noticed because he talks about the different talents that we have. Some of us walk into the room and say, you know what, but people don't care the way I do. That's because God put it on your heart in a different way. So if it's not there, if it's neglected, start it. Start it. Grow it and allow other people who have the same gifting to follow you and help expand the kingdom of God. It's so easy to blame other people. Uh, one, one person even stated it like this. He said, you know, um, or she said she knows that a lot of people that say they want to do these things and start these things, they step into ministry and then they start to notice that all the eyes start to be on their life. <laughs> And it could be overwhelming. And so people step away from that. And they're like, no, 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 I'm going to leave that to the pastors. Instead, no, no, God has called you. Don't be intimidated. Don't be afraid of what the enemy tries to throw your way. God is working on your heart. He loves you so much. He's going to use you. I want you to know that God is real. I want you to move by faith. But here's what I, under, or here's what I want you to understand today about this story right here. Here's the big idea. Um, God led Israel out of Egypt, but Egypt never left the minds of the Israelites. Okay. They were anxious because they could not move forward from the past. Why? Because their minds were not able to trust God. My question for you today out of love is have you been able to move past the traumatic experience in your life? What do you do when life has moved on, but your mind hasn't? It's still there. This is where many believers are right now. Uh, When this happens, the fear is still replaying over and over in your mind. So let me make it very clear for you today. That is a stronghold. That is a stronghold. And you must retrain the way you think looking at the promises of God, breaking down that stronghold a little at a time. It's okay, you don't have to rush it. Just a little at a time to remember the promises of God. Why do you have an anxious mind today? Here's the good news. You can give your anxiety over to God. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. That is a powerful verse. You can cast your anxieties to the living God, the one true God. Why? Because he cares about your situation. He cares about your life. Listen to what Paul stated. Somebody who knows what it's like to wrestle with the past. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. He said, I focus on one thing, forgetting the past. If God has forgotten your past, If God has chosen to let go of your past, why are you still holding on to it? For a lot of people, they know that God has forgiven them, but they have a hard time forgiving themselves. He said, I focus on one thing. I, I focus on forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race. God has given you a race. And I want to receive the heavenly prize, he said, for which God through Jesus Christ is calling us. When I'm running a race, I can't look behind me because I'll trip, I'll fall, I'll be misled, I'll go the wrong direction. I keep looking forward. That's how you win the race. Keep observing the promises of God. Keep believing in what he's spoken over you and step into the promise. You are not who you used to be. And this leads to my, my last point, which is this. We talked about the double mind. Uh, we talked about an anxious mind. And the last point is this, a, a sober mind. A sober mind. And here's the definition of a sober mind. It's actually a mind of clarity from God. To have a sober mind means that you have full clarity of what God has spoken over your life. Listen to what Paul advised to Titus, 
on how to choose the right godly leader over the church. He said in Titus chapter 1, verse 8, he said this leader needs to be hospitable, a lover over what is good. And then he said sober-minded, just, holy, self-control. And, and Paul stated this a lot in a couple of his letters over the sober-minded uh, people. I think he said it around 10 times shortly. And so when we look at the word sober-minded, again, what does it mean? It means to have clarity from God. There's a difference about a sober mind compared to a mind that's staying away from drunkenness. There is a difference. Okay, so Paul is not uh, stating here a sober mind doesn't just mean uh, staying away from drunkenness because Paul addressed that already in verse 7. And he said he must not be a heavy drinker. So this person must not be consumed by alcohol. He's already addressed that. So now he's going into something else and he's talking about a sober mind. And here's what God revealed to me. Uh, He's making the point that the devil wants to intoxicate your mind with the problems of the world. The devil wants to intoxicate your mind um, with your circumstances, your issues, and overwhelm you with worry. Because other things can intoxicate your mind instead of alcohol. Uh, The news can intoxicate your mind with fear. Friends can intoxicate your mind with gossip. Insecurities can intoxicate your mind with failure. And God spoke this recently to me, and it gave me such peace. So I pray that it gives you peace today. I heard God say, get out of your head. Get out of your head. Because sometimes we create something in our head that's not reality. That's not actually happening. Sometimes we're afraid that the enemy is attacking and we feel like a failure. But if you just step back and get out of your head, you can see God moving. And you can see the miracles taking place and you can see his promises coming to life. And I realized that God pretty much said the same thing to Moses. He was telling Moses, get out of your head, Moses. When God first met Moses, it was in Exodus 3, 10 and 11. And God said, now go. He gave him a mission. He said, for I'm sending you to Pharaoh and you must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, who am I to lead Israel out of Egypt? Who am I? Immediately, that was his first thought. Pretty much what Moses was stating is, I'm unworthy to do this task. And so I had a great conversation with a friend last week, and he was wrestling with the same thing. And I told him, you know what? I felt that too, because the truth is, none of us are worthy to speak the name of God or to do his will, but he is worthy to preach about. He's worthy to give your life over to. And so when he speaks of your life, because if he is worthy, do it. Stop holding back. And so God answered him and said, I will be with you, Moses. But still Moses argued, Exodus 4, 10 through 12, Moses pleaded with the Lord, oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, I'm not now. Even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue tied. My words get tangled. Then the Lord asked Moses, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak? Hear or do not hear, see or do not see. Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will be with you as you speak and I will instruct you on what to say. God was stating to Moses, get out of your head and start listening to my promises. Because what's amazing to me is that God is speaking over Moses. This is my promise for you. But he couldn't even hear the promise because he kept listening to his fear. His fear was telling him that you're not going to be able to accomplish this. This can't happen for you. Is that happening in your mind right now? God's speaking, but you can't hear him because fear is speaking too loud. Shut the fear up in the name of Jesus Christ. Shut the voices of the demons up in the name of Jesus Christ. They have to leave and write the promise down. For he who writes it plainly on tablets may read it and run with it. 
you can run with it. And so is this you? Are you intoxicated because of your fear of others? Then I want to challenge you today to ask the Lord for a sober mind, with clarity. Um, I believe the Lord worked deeply on my heart with this message. And the reason why he changed it so many times before today is because I believe I need to preach a series on this message, on the topic of the mindset and the war on the mind. And so that's going to be the next series. Um, once we finish this, we got one more week of this one. And then we're going to talk about war on the mind and how to be free in this area. And so before you leave today, I just want to leave you with three steps that you can apply to your life if you're going through these things. Step one is this, get out of your head, okay? Don't allow your thoughts to control you. Recognize that that thought came from the outside. Just because you thought it doesn't mean it came from you. It could have been planted by the enemy or something you're watching, something you're listening to or other people around you. But instead, allow the Holy Spirit to control your thoughts. For the Bible also states that we wage war, <laughs> that our flesh wages war with the Spirit of God, but allow the Spirit of God to move in your life. When you have a thought, actually ask the Holy Spirit to calm it down. Ask the Holy Spirit to take away your anxiety and your fear. Ask the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of peace and comfort, Jesus said, to bring you that comfort right now in the situation you're facing. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, we destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. We capture, we capture the rebellious thoughts and force them to look at the promises of God's word. Okay? The second thing is this. Step two, fill your mind. Do not empty your mind. Fill your mind, do not empty your mind. If your mind is empty, remember the parable of Jesus, the man had demons cast out, his mind was empty, demons were able to come back in. If your mind is empty, that leaves you vulnerable for a demonic attack, but you should fill your mind up with the word of God instead, okay? Be in the word of God. This is how you rest. The world will tell you differently. The world will say you have to empty your mind in order to rest, no. That's a demonic principle that has pagan roots completely. The Bible tells us to fill up your mind with the word of God in order to rest. Philippians chapter four, verse eight, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. This is what you should fill your mind up with, okay? But step three, the last step is this. You really want peace today? Then crucify the expectations of others. Moses had a problem with the people because he was trying to live up to their expectations. One of my favorite stories about Moses is when he was in the presence of God, he would glow. This is called the Shekinah glory. He would come down and he would actually glow. But then Paul tells us in Corinthians that he put a veil over his face because he was afraid for the people to see the glory fading away because he was trying to live up to their expectations. If you try to live for people, you will never have peace. Yeah. Now love people, help people, spread the gospel to people, see that they're created in the image of God, but don't have your self-worth come from people's opinions or what they say about you. Let your self-worth come from God. And then take your expectations of other people as well and put that on the cross as well. What you want from other people, how you put them on a pedestal, how you made them perfect in your own mind. Listen, everything you truly need can only come from Jesus, can only come from God. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. <laughs> I love what he stated. He said, I'm obviously not trying to flatter you or water down my message to be popular with men. But my supreme passion is to please God. For if I attempt to do, or if all I attempt to do is to please people, I would fail to be a true servant of Christ. 
Come to Jesus, find rest. It's that easy. Trust God to find rest over your mind. And whatever battle you're facing, whatever trash that's in your life, leave it at the altar. Stop picking it back up. Just because your situation has changed, I'm telling you today, God is still in control. So don't be afraid of that. Hey, if you enjoyed today's sermon and would like to be part of Authentic Church, go ahead and take the next step and sign up for our next steps online. You can live anywhere in the world and still be part of Authentic Church. Also, I want to say thank you so much for watching today. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to either subscribe or follow to any of our social media accounts so that you can see any new content that will be uploaded. And if you'd like to give to this church to help us financially, go ahead and click that Give button down below to help us reach more people for Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again very soon.